from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Markets are in rally mode with an hour left in the trading day. NVIDIA shares are soaring and bringing the broader markets with them. The Nasdaq on the doorstep of hitting an all-time high, and the Dow's on track to close above 39,000 for the first time ever. Meanwhile, NVIDIA and the AI boom lifting shares of companies across the sector from suppliers to software makers. We're going to hear from two companies in the space, including SoundHound, which just got an investment from NVIDIA. And while NVIDIA is dominating, the headlines say there are plenty of other stocks that you should be watching. We're tracking all the market action so that you can make the best moves for your portfolio. Let's get you up to speed on the market action right now. And there is a lot of it as we are looking for a potential record maybe in the NASDAQ uh, composite. 16,057.44 would be the number to beat. So we're not quite there today. But I believe that the S&P and the NASDAQ 100 uh, could be on track for records. Those are the ones where we've been seeing some streaks here. So we're going to continue to watch those in the NASDAQ. Composite and the 100 are having their best day in more than a year here. Right now, the Dow up 410 points, the S&P gaining 2%, and the NASDAQ up by nearly 3%, up 2.8% right now as we see this big rally. We do. And here's a name that's rallying that we're going to start the show up with, Julie. Of course we have to start the show with Let's, this. Uh, where in, else would where we else? start? <laughs> NVIDIA shares, they are surging more than 15% heading into the close here. Tech giant's earnings beat defied fears that AI enthusiasm has peaked, fueling a wider rally across other names in the AI trade. With more, we're joined now by Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer. Joshua. Yeah, Josh, so NVIDIA beats earnings and then a bunch of companies not named NVIDIA also sort of benefit from that, right? And when you take a look broadly across the AI trade that we sort of track here pretty frequently, you're seeing a lot of names up. Uh, some companies we have been watching recently, NVIDIA was revealed they made investments in SoundHound and ARM. Both of those stocks are up today. You see AMD, a fellow chip maker, up over 11% today. And then I want to hone in on that last one a little bit because this has been a crazy momentum trade in supermicrocomputer. We have been tracking that over the past week or so, guys. The shares really took off over AI enthusiasm. You can see today up 32%, up over 230% on the year. And to me, one of the biggest questions coming into NVIDIA earnings was just simply, you know, have we hit peak AI enthusiasm. We, mm. I, I think it's not necessarily surprising to a lot of people that have followed NVIDIA earnings over the last couple quarters that they beat the streets estimates. They came out with great numbers. They didn't really say anything that shocking. So it's been interesting to just track the investor enthusiasm, but not only in the AI trade, guys, but when you broaden out and sort of what it means for Julian Emanuel over Evercore called it the FOMO rally. Yeah. And mm -hmm. FOMO doesn't necessarily just mean AI stocks either, which I think is an important thing to highlight. We talked about the broader averages that are hitting record highs right now, and even some stocks like a JP Morgan, waste management, hitting record highs today. I wouldn't really call JP Morgan an AI play, right? But right. Or investors, waste for that right? Yeah. And, and, and but investors getting excited to essentially get in the market seems to be a little bit of the theme today as well. You know, it was really interesting when those Nvidia numbers came out last night. Initially, the stock did pull back a little mm -hmm. bit. And I don't think either Josh or I was surprised, right? Because there was such enthusiasm. I'm more surprised to see this rally continuing and everything else going along with it. And it is interesting that the FOMO trade idea is coming up again. We've seen glimmers of it in recent weeks, mm -hmm. right? With something like a super micro and everybody's sort of piling into that. But it feels a little bit like the go-go days of early, even 2021, right? Mm -hmm. When people were st stuck at home they had stimulus checks and they were looking to get into the market. There is a little a little bit of that feeling again. No, there definitely is, and especially, Julie, when you think about the other stocks, like I mentioned, we talk about Supermicro. NVIDIA is the company that reported earnings. And NVIDIA stock is up about 15%, which is a sizable move in a large company. But Supermicro stock is up double that. It's up 30%. It's just interesting to see sort of where inv investors are kind of placing their bets at this point in maybe areas where the stock hasn't rallied as much. So NVIDIA is saying the AI story is good to go. Where else can I maybe benefit from that AI trade in other areas? Because maybe NVIDIA isn't necessarily the play because the stock's gone up so much. I, I just, just trying to rationalize essentially yeah. where investors are, are placing the Well, I think there's also probably some options sure. supercharging that is going <laughs> on with all of this, right? And yep. that that is also 
playing a factor in, in, in the moves that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing, guys, too, that I think is interesting to think about here that you guys talk about a lot is the other news that we're just kind of overlooking over the past week and a half, right? We have this sort of, it feels like Julie said, the, the go-go days of maybe 2021 or something, and we're not talking about the Fed narrative that people now think that the rate cuts are coming in June a week ago. That mattered eh, a lot. Who cares? The inflation report mattered a lot a week ago. Well, what right? about, let me and, ask you this. Yeah. If you were asked, if you were thinking about next catalyst for the market, so NVIDIA now, rear view mirror, mm -hmm. what, so talking that, so would the next catalyst, what's the next, you know, next event you would have on your calendar, PCE? It's probably the PCE yeah. report coming next week, yeah. right? And we're going to probably get back to the market being focused a little bit on the inflation story and what that overall means for the Fed. And all of these stocks that are rallying today, when you sit back and think about what does it matter if interest rates are higher for longer for that specific company or that specific sector? Right now, I think there's a lot of euphoria and it's great and it's a one day thing. But I think when you zoom out, yes, Josh, at some point, the conversation probably does go back a little bit to the macro. Well, and, and just one final point to make on the Fed, right? The, the calculation was always if the Fed's going to be cutting, why is it going to be cutting, right? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be cutting because things are back to normal and the economy is going well, or is it going to be cutting because the economy is taking a turn for the worse? It seems to be the first one of those, and that's why they're getting pu pu pushed back, and that's why perhaps the market seems okay with if it. If the economy is doing well, that's a good backdrop yeah. for equities, right? Yeah. It feels that way. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Well, NVIDIA posting that big earnings beat, and CEO Jensen Wong saying in the release that AI has, quote, hit the tipping point. Now we're talking to one AI, AI company that uh, NVIDIA has a vested interest in. The chip giant recently announcing it poured $3.7 million into SoundHound AI. Joining us now, co-founder and CEO of SoundHound, that is Kayvon Mohajer. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate Thank you for it, having Kayvon. me. So that tipping point uh, comment, I think, caught a, a lot of people's attention. What does it mean to you and what does it mean to your business? And do you agree that we're, we've sort of reached that tipping point? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people, when the big bang of generative AI happened last year, some people thought, is this a short lasting hype? And uh, some people like Jensen said, this is, you know, this is bigger than the internet. And we agree with that. Uh, so if you look at uh, what's, we, what we think is going to come next is the wave of uh, experiences that people are going to use generative AI for to create a lot of value, right? So with the analogy is, iOS and Android were the big bang. And then for more than 10 years, apps and apps and apps, and some of those apps were new experiences for the first time, created billions of dollars of value. And uh, we expect the same thing will happen with generative AI. So years of value creation and experiences, and that's what SoundHand does. And, and Kevin, let me ask you just about that NVIDIA stake. I'm just interested to hear more about you know, how that came about, Kayvon, and, and what do you plan now to do with that money? How does SoundHound put that to work? Uh, yeah, so we've known NVIDIA for a number of years, and they are a great company. We respect them a lot, and they specialize in, they create the infrastructure for AI, and SoundHand puts that infrastructure to good use. Uh, so the synergy is very clear, and uh, the amount of investment is not as big as we are a public company and well capitalized. Uh, but um, what it does for us is two things, uh, validation, and alliance, right? And we've attracted a number of strategic investors like Hyundai and Oracle and Vizio and Samsung uh, have invested in us. Uh, and it validation because they bring their own experts to look at our technology and our vision. And when they take the equity, it checks the box. And uh, alliance because it brings us closer together. And we are able to turn some of those into really big customers like Hyundai. Uh, Kevin, another question though, you know, these reports, I saw Kayvon and you saw them, the options volume and, and sound in, in your company kind of surge here in the days, like I guess leading up to NVIDIA's filing, you know, announcing that stake. That, that can be the thing, Kayvon, a kind of thing that regulators sometimes do get interested in. What can you tell us about that? Uh, a speculation, and I think it's wrong. Uh, well, first of all, who, who knows? But uh, if you look at, they looked at some companies that NVIDIA invested in, and some, some volume went up uh, before the announcement. But if you look at all the other AI companies, like Big Bear, their volume went up too. So I, don't, I, I think it was unrelated to NVIDIA. Yeah, but to your point, there has been this, we were just talking about it with, with Josh Schaefer a few moments ago, this enthusiasm, maybe even this mania that people just you know are falling over themselves to invest in companies like yours. Now, you say that this is bigger than the internet, that this is a huge opportunity. So is something like SoundHound undervalued then at these levels, if that's the case? Well, we uh, obviously we think long term, and I'll, I'll tell you what you're doing, and, and mm -hmm. yeah, you can judge. Uh, so we, we made two, two predictions, and we are focusing on those. The first one is that AI customer service 
will be as necessary to every business as Wi-Fi and electricity. So you create a new business, you sign up for an internet, you sign up for electricity, you sign up for AI customer service, and we provide AI customer service for businesses. Uh, the second prediction is that uh, we prefer a voice as the interface to devices, to physical products, right? So I have a three-year-old daughter who knows how to speak. Uh, she's going around the house and talking to everything. Uh, not everything is listening to her, but um, she knows how to speak. I still have to teach her how to type and use a mouse and everything, but speaking is a natural way. And the reason we're not talking to devices yet is because the technology wasn't ready. Now, because of generative AI, it is ready. And fortunately for product creators, a microphone is all they need. It's a very inexpensive small microphone is all they need to enable their devices with the most natural interface. So we are focusing on that too. So we are enabling cars and TVs and IoT devices. We are in millions of devices and we are powering customer service. We are in 10,000 locations with 100,000 in our pipeline with 30 million businesses that can be enabled. That's a $100 billion opportunity. It's an opportunity that a lot of others are chasing also, right? You do have competitors in the market who are working on this same problem. What makes sound how different? Is it the data set that you're drawing from, or what exactly is it? So there's the big tech, and there's the smaller newcomers, right? So we've been in this for 20 years. Uh, it's a vision that we came up with in Stanford University dorm room, and we've been pursuing it for a long time. Uh, so the, the, when the generative AI revolution happened, the big tech had to go and build their own. They're not going to go and use an open AI API, right? So, and that's going to take them a couple of years. So they're going to give us time to go faster. And the smaller players, um, generative AI is not that easy to make it work, right? So it's not a plug and play. We have to do a ton of software engineering to reduce hallucination, to make them do the right thing, to go from a demo to a live, to a live product. And we are really good at that. And that, that gives us the advantage. Okay, I'm interested, does your product work better? And by better, I mean, you know, does it respond more quickly and more accurately than the voice engines a lot of our viewers will be familiar with from, from big tech, from, from Google and Amazon and Apple? Yeah, we actually have, we have been for uh, for a long time uh, known to be the the AI that had handles more complex queries. So like you, you can ask, you know, show me ra Asian restaurants, but not Chinese, not Japanese. Maybe we had Chinese food yesterday that are open after 9 p.m. on on Thursdays and have more than three stars and are within walking distance of the Space Needle, right? So we can actually handle queries like that. Uh, and now that we've integrated generative AI, you can ac actually have an endless conversation with it. Ask for recommendation and opinions and gift ideas and go back and forth between them. And we were very quick to integrate it. We ran a pilot with one of our customers called Stellantis in Europe. The results of the pilot was incredible. The user satisfaction went through the roof. Uh, usage went up multiple folds. And yesterday we announced we are the first voice AI vendor to partner with a car company to go live in production. This is not a pilot in 18 countries. Like all of the things that we're discussing with AI, especially with images, for example, there's also this sort of uneasiness, right? That you're interacting with something that is not real or not another person, and that there are certain pitfalls of that. How do you think about that issue? Uh, yeah, so um, there are a lot of issues, like the hallucination is an issue, and um, um, copyright, and ethics, and all that. And we take those very seriously. The things that we focus on, um, uh, hallucination is the most important one, and we worked a lot to reduce that almost to negligible, and we're very proud of that. Uh, I think the bigger risk in AI is not embracing it fast enough, right? So there are companies that are kind of disoriented, and they're waiting and seeing, and, and uh, are, or they just want to check a box, let's just make an announcement. I think this is a moment to create a lot of value, and the fast movers are going to be the winners. Mm. All right, thanks so much. Appreciate it, Kayvon. Kayvon Mojadjer uh, of SoundCloud. SoundHound, oh my goodness, thank, thank you so much. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the Biden administration set to invest $20 billion to replace China-made cranes at Nations Ports. We're breaking down the potential cyber threats the ports could be facing and the impacts they may have on the supply chains. Plus, Synopsys moving higher following its latest earnings report. We'll speak to the company's Sassine Ghazi, who's the CEO, later in the hour. And shares of Royal Caribbean higher today after raising its earnings guidance. We'll check in on the cruise liner as well as some other trending tickers after the break.
Caribbean jumping after boosting its full year guidance. The company is saying it continues to be very encouraged about the demand and pricing environment for 2024. So this was a nice move in today's trade. And it was about um, that kind of expectations and the profit forecast, truly. So now they see adjusted EPS 990 to 1010. They had been seeing 950 to 970. And by the way, you saw peers like Carnival Norwegian, which reports, reports results next week. They were also trading higher. World Caribbean just set this forecast three weeks ago. It is astonishing to see them come out already yeah. with this kind of an upgrade. And they said in this statement, since our last earnings call, robust demand for our vacation experiences has significantly exceeded our initial expectations. And you don't frequently see this kind of an update mm -hmm. in that kind of time frame. So indeed, this is something that investors seem really encouraged, uh, encouraged by. Um, and, um, you know, basically, one of the analysts said this might have been in reaction to some negative chatter on the street that there had been softness in booking. So now, uh, this according to Truish Securities, Patrick Scholes, the company coming out and feeling like perhaps that it had to refute that and it did that in this statement. You wonder if it also maybe foreshadows good things for Norwegian, mm. which is reporting results next week. By the way, this stock is up now 70% in the past 12 months. And one more thing to mention here, with the stock going up, Royal Caribbean is now doing a bond offering, junk bond offering of a billion dollars, um, and it's the first debt offering by a cruise line operator this year. Why is this important? These companies carry a lot of debt, right, because mm. ships are expensive. Um, so it's interesting that they're going to the market here um, in order to try to finance some of the ships that they got sure. out there. Um, let's also talk about an upgrade for DoorDash. It's from Morgan Stanley. Upgrading DoorDash to overweight, the firm seeing leading growth and profit execution, driving better than expected cash flow for the company. The shares are up by 6% in today's session. Uh, and basically, they say that the runway remains long for the company's core restaurant and grocery growth, and that that's a positive for the company. And remember, they just reported results results very yeah. recently and the stock slid yeah. on those results hard because some weren't happy with the guidance and specifically the guidance for full year marketplace gross order value. That's what upset some investors. But clearly Morgan Stanley sees that as a way to get in, a time to get in, sees opportunity. And the move though, even with that recent slide, you look at this stock, I mean, it's still up about 20% already this year. It's up more than 100% in the past 12 months. Yeah, and Morgan Stanley addressed that pullback directly. They say it was driven by investor concern surrounding investment levels, competitive dynamics, and forward guidance achievability. But they say we have confidence in the company's model uh, in part because because of what they say is the durable U.S. restaurant business. Yeah, Shree's actually kind of divided on this one. 20 buys, 17 holds, two sells, but not Morgan Stanley. Yeah. No, they feel confident. Yes. Meanwhile, shares of Novavax rise in today. That's after resolving a battle with a global nonprofit regarding COVID-19 vaccines. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani joins us now with more. Anjali. That's right, Josh. So Novavax coming out with this agreement to refund a portion of the advance payments given to it by Gavi, which was supposed to go towards doses that never came. Uh, we know the Novavax saga has been full of hurdles in terms of it reaching the finish line when it came to the COVID-19 doses, basically missing the pandemic altogether. Initially, Gavi had given about $700 million, and that had stayed on Novavax's books as a potential liability. Uh, that it had really worried investors, and that is more, by the way, than the cash on hand that currently the, the company had reported back in September about $666 million only. So right now, that May agreement from 2021 has been reversed. The issue has been resolved. And the companies are looking to working together. Novavax already repaying $75 million of the agreed $400 million. That would be the total that they agreed to uh, refund. And then there's also talk of, in the middle of this agreement, uh, credits, essentially, so that Gavi can access Novavax doses, whether it be COVID or others, down the line. So this, as you can see on your screen, really giving the company a boost today, uh, really it had been hurting for one after the continued uh, sort of disappointments along the way in the last couple of years. So good news for Novavax there. Anjali, thank you so much, appreciate it. Meanwhile, cybersecurity at U.S. ports has been in the spotlight this week. The Biden administration announcing it will invest $20 billion to upgrade equipment, warning current Chinese-made cranes could be a threat to national security. The Port of Los Angeles has been investing in ways to prevent cyber attacks since 2019, and the executive director, Gene Soroka, joins us now. Gene, thank you for being here. 
Good to see you, Josh. So, so Gene, let's get right into this news. So the Biden administration, it's going to invest billions here, right? Replace these China Chinese-made cranes at our ports. What is this, Gene, going to mean for, for the Port of Los Angeles? Well, it goes a little deeper than that as well. Looking at what the Port of Los Angeles has done in partnership with the Department of Homeland Security, about 10 years ago, we put in the nation's first cybersecurity operations center. Just last year, it stopped 750 million cyber intrusion attempts, and that wasn't enough for us. With IBM, we co-created one of the world's first cyber resilience centers that brought in our private sector partners. And to date, a little over 15 months in, we've stopped six intrusion attempts to private sector interests of which they were unaware. Now the focus begins on trying to get some of this equipment manufactured in the United States so we can take a little more control over national security as it relates to the supply chain. Okay, so I want to linger on this a little bit because those are big numbers and surprising numbers that we're seeing all of these, these attempted incursions. Are they coming from the hardware? Are they coming in some cases from cranes that are made elsewhere or where what do we know about where they originate well, i won't speak for the national security experts but safe to say about 50 percent of the cranes at the port of los angeles are manufactured in china they're taking up data analyzing it and using it for what we just don't know at this point in time but the federal government under president biden's direction doesn't want to take chances in this but, area. but that seems sort of speculative doesn't it i mean you know you're running this port, you talked about all those incursions, like if you don't know where they're coming from and who's doing them, it's hard to stop them instead of just sort of guessing at where they might be coming from. No? Not necessarily true. Okay. If we go downstairs on the second floor into that cybersecurity center, we can see the IP addresses, the nation states involved, and the flow of those intrusion attempts, no matter whether they're coming to Los Angeles or points beyond. So we've got a pretty good idea with respect to our information, where that is happening. And the federal government has a deeper look as well. Gene, I'm curious though, because you know China has posed a national security risk for some time. China is an adversary. So I'm curious, why in the first place were there Chinese made cranes at our ports? Was it, was it cost? Was it there just wasn't, there wasn't domestic manufacturers? Well, Josh, like much everything else, yeah. we've shipped manufacturing overseas the past 45 to 50 years. Cranes, chassis wheels that move our containers around, as well as those container boxes. We don't make that or any of those products in the United States. And part of the efforts of people like Secretary Gina Raimondo at Commerce and others is to try to reshore, nearshore some of this manufacturing work so we can tighten up the supply chains and help American companies grow. I mean, this is a huge endeavor, just like it, the reshoring the chip industry, for example. Going to take time, going to take money, going to take labor. I mean, when are we going to start to see U.S. made um, equipment in U.S. ports. Yeah, you're right, Julie. It's not going to be a flip of a switch. But I think we've got subsidiaries and a couple of companies were named in the press release from Washington the other night, and we'll see more and more start getting interested. Just like the, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, the idea here is the federal government is putting in multi, multi-billion dollars worth of investment, giving confidence to the private sector to come and invest behind that. Mm. And, and gee, I want to switch gears here a little bit. I'm just interested to get your take. What do cargo volumes look right, right right now at the Port of LA, Gene? Are they strong, are they soft? What do you see now and, and looking ahead? I'm encouraged, Josh. Six straight months of year-on-year -year growth. We've got a dock workers contract now that gives us a line of sight of confidence for the next five years. January was our second best on record. And my prognosis for the first quarter is about 20% growth mm. thus far. Um, of course, we're watching what's going on around the globe in terms of shipping, in particular in the Mideast with some of the attacks that are going on there. But the way that the flow of shipping works around the globe, does that affect what's going on on the west coast of the U.S.? It does. Okay. And it's yet another series of issues for supply chain executives to have front of mind. I was in India and Southeast Asia last month. My days in the Middle East, I still have a lot of contacts and keep up with those men and women who are driving supply chains. What we're seeing is a couple things. One, Panama Canal drought about 23% less or fewer crossings in the first six weeks of the year thus far. The canal authority is doing a great job. They're trying to shuttle by train cargo from the Pacific to the Atlantic and onward movement to the U.S. In the Middle East, now shipping lines are taking their vessels around the Cape of Good Hope, adding additional ships in so they could maintain their fixed 
weekly services. What I heard on the ground in South and Southeast Asia was that importers and exporters are now starting to shift their cargo to the west coast of the United States. And we'll see a little bit more of that as the weeks and months go on. This is not going to end anytime soon. During my time in the Middle East, we were faced with the Somali interests and the pirates that were going after vessels and tankers in the Red Sea. It took some time and a tremendous allied effort as response. And Gene, one big question for investors is the supply chains, of course, you know, upended during the pandemic. Uh, you got interesting line of sight there. What are you seeing? We look at a dashboard of statistics every morning, Josh, and the numbers I see, the vitals, are at or better than where they were before COVID. The ship that comes in now makes the most transfers of any in the world at about 12,000 containers loaded and unloaded per vessel call. And that ship work is about four and a half days. That is right where we want it to be. Yeah. Truck and rail cargo moving off the port just where it should be. And in the case of trucking, a little bit better than it was mm. before the surge happened. Um, there was a lot of talk during the pandemic when everything was jammed up that there needed to be work on the technology driving mm. shipping, driving ports, driving um, trucking as well. Have we seen those changes take effect and that's part of what's benefiting or is it just that things have kind of eased but now that also means that the pressure to improve things has eased a little bit. Yeah, I, I think a combination of all that, mm -hmm. Julie. And what we did in Los Angeles was create the nation's first port community system called the Port Optimizer with the Wab Tech Company. And it allows us to be able to look pre and post shipment to understand what the bottlenecks are, what's causing them and how we can fix them. During the surge, what we found is one simple causal, and that was that cargo was sitting for much longer than it should and that place needs to be a transit facility, not a storage center. So if we can keep the velocity going, we call it dwell times. If that cargo moves out by truck in three or four days, by rail in two to four days, then suddenly that velocity helps. And it will continue to be the data mining that allows us to get smarter every day and more and more companies coming in to help us with that. And, and Jay, I want to get you out of here on one last question about China. You know, obviously there was, you know, some people who thought you were going to see a post-COVID boom there, it hasn't happened, it's, it's, it's pretty shaky. What does that mean for the Port of LA? What's the impact? China's business with the Port of LA represents about 53% of all the containers that we move. And while many executives tell me they're looking at a China plus one strategy, we'll probably see that number drop into the mid 40s over time, but they'll still be a dominant trading partner with the Port of LA. And it's interesting because we've got a different lens that we look through. When I was in China last summer, really not worried about the economic growth, talking about circular economy, but at 5.8% GDP, a lot of folks were nervous about that. Mm. So we've got to kind of level set expectations and see how that migration of sourcing, manufacturing, and export flow will take place with these strategies going forward. Interesting stuff. Thanks, Gene. Good to see you. Great to see you both. Thanks for coming Thank to visit us in New York. Appreciate it. Well, still to come, the CEO of Synopsys, Asim Ghazi, joins us on the other side of the break to talk about the company's latest earnings report, as well as the impact of NVIDIA on the rest of the tech and semiconductor industry. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance coming up.
NVIDIA, the rising tide lifting all boats for markets around the world. Jared Blickery is here with a look at the global action on the day. Jared. Josh, let us count the ways here. I can talk about the U.S. First, I want to highlight that in Japan, this market already closed over a dozen hours ago. This is a Nikkei. I'm going to put a max chart. 39,000 was roughly the level to beat. First reach in 1989. Well, the Nikkei has finally eclipsed that. All the more notable because the Japanese economy looks like it's in a recession right now. And to, to see this kind of explosive stock growth takes a lot of things. It takes a, an interest rate structure, uh, but it also takes a theme. And arguably, AI has propelled stocks all around the globe to uh, achieve their various aims. And the Nikkei, well, Interesting to see it hit another high 34 years later. Now, the NASDAQ composite is having its best day in over a year. You'd have to go back to Groundhog Day last year to see a better day than about 3% right there. And by the way, we are set for a record close in the NASDAQ composite. Have not had one of those in a couple of years, although the NASDAQ 100, that has been hitting record highs uh, all year long here and in the back half of last year as well. Now, here are the record highs today. Let me show you a market cap view here, and you can see See NVIDIA, the big guy, up 16%, but look at Meta, up 4%, Broadcom up 6%. All of these stocks here are at record highs. Berkshire Hathaway doesn't have a lot to do with chips, although Apple is one of its biggest holdings or is its biggest holdings. You see Visa in there, JP Morgan, I could go down the list. A lot of these names have been hitting record highs already, but let me just show you what's going on in the semiconductor space. Aside from NVIDIA and Broadcom, we got Taiwan Semi up 3.5%, Applied Material of 5%. And then I was taking a look at this list, which I was showing yesterday afternoon. This is our top one-day market cap gainers. The most ever was $197 billion by Meta, and that was less than a month ago. That was at the beginning of February on its earnings day. Forget $197 billion. We have now hit $250 billion, and actually north of that, and I'm going to update that figure after the close, $250 billion for NVIDIA today alone, by far the record. And uh, we'll have to see. I don't know who's going to beat this. I don't even want to speculate how, but I, I see it happening somehow. Yeah, I, th I would think it'll happen. The numbers at some get point, bigger every day. Somehow, I love that big 250 billion illustration on there. We'll Thank get you. to we'll get we'll get caught up and updated after the close. Thanks, Jared. Another top mover in today's session, Synopsys, the chip software design maker, reporting strong results last night after the close and also raised its full year adjusted earnings guidance. Joining us now, Synopsys CEO Sassine Ghazi. Sassine, it's good to see you. Great to see you, Julie. So talk to me about what was driving the business. Something that struck me is that, you know, all of this talk of generative AI, and of course you talked about AI on the call, but you also talked about what you call pervasive intelligence. What does pervasive intelligence mean, and how is that driving demand for your products? If you look at various market segments, and uh, uh, say automotive, industrial, et cetera, and you envision the future, five, 10 years from now, all these segments are going to be more connected and smarter, which the underpinning for uh, that inflection point is going to happen through semiconductor chips. So when we talk about pervasive intelligence, we're talking about the AI as the mega trend, silicon proliferation everywhere. And most of these system companies, they have to uh, have a view of their silicon in order to support that uh, software application ambition that they have. So, see, when we look at your, you know, the industry, the market you operate in, it's basically a, it's a duopoly scene. It's you and Cadence. I mean, you design chips, that's where you go to. What for viewers who are listening right now, so see, what would you say your competitive advantages are there? So it's true that uh, the, the, our customer base has been the semiconductor customer. But if you look at Synopsys today, about 45% of our revenue are system companies, the hyperscalers, the automotive OEMs, the big mobile OEMs, et cetera. So the world is shifting towards more companies designing their own silicon in order to take advantage of an integrated uh, stack of application. One of the key uh, competitive advantage we have is our leadership with AI for designing chips. We pioneered that in 2020. The other advantage is what we call design IP. To simplify it, if you think of any chip design today, 
they are, think of it as Lego blocks. And we provide many of these Lego blocks, semiconductor components for our chip customers to accelerate their chip design process. Well, and then of course, you're hoping to maybe gain another competitive advantage with your acquisition of ANSYS for $35 billion, which you, uh, I know you're hoping to close in the first half of next year. What yes. then does that sort of bolt on to the capabilities you were just discussing? And also, what does that do to your client base? Do you see an expansion there? Absolutely, because the current client base is semiconductor chip uh, companies expanding into system companies that they're designing chips. But there are many other system companies, think about an automotive OEM or an industrial OEM, that they have no uh, skills or desire to go all the way down to the chip design uh, part of uh, their uh, end uh, product. But what they want to do is make sure their products are getting smarter, they're taking advantage of AI. So the ability to architect that system or the end product, what I refer by system is the end product, it can be the whole car. How do you interface between the electronics aspect of the car, the mechanical, the electrical, and you think of the whole product as a holistic approach to designing it. What ANSYS brings in is a significant market uh, presence and uh, trust by those customers outside the semiconductor space where we have a very strong uh, history uh, and leadership in. And Sassine, how are you feeling about regulatory approval of that deal? As we know, it's been a little bit of a tougher environment. So we started, uh, so we just announced the deal roughly about five weeks ago, and uh, we started the regulatory filing. Uh, we believe it will be manageable, otherwise we would not have jumped into the significant bet that we're making. And uh, we'll be filing an S4 in the next few weeks in which we will outline the various jurisdictions approach to uh, filing. So that's point one. The other point we'd like to emphasize is the overwhelming support we're getting from customers, both semiconductor and system companies, that they're looking forward for such a, an integration of solution in order for them to drive their product innovation. So we have strong uh, global customer uh, willing to lean in and support the transaction, as well as we don't believe uh, there should be much uh, in terms of uh, pushback, given our portfolio is very complementary. We don't have much overlap in the portfolio. So, Sine, finally, I wanted to ask you about the NVIDIA effect, since we've been talking about the NVIDIA effect all day. <laughs> You know, we've talked about it mostly in the context of the market, but I'm curious from your perspective, and I believe NVIDIA is a client, what the effect is on the industry. In other words, is there as much enthusiasm um, for clients to sort of, sort of push money at AI and just be spending on um, semiconductors and semiconductor related products more generally because of what's going on with NVIDIA? It, maybe let me give you a different perspective. Okay. Let me give you the silicon up per perspective. So if you're in the semiconductor world, what you're seeing for sure is happening is the demand for more and more sophisticated semiconductor chips. NVIDIA has done an incredible job. And of course, NVIDIA is a very strong customer and partner. Uh, they've done a very good job to serve the AI uh, training in data center, which is exploding in terms of opportunities, as well as looking at opportunity for inferences, et cetera. However, the use cases of AI are so broad that there are many, many opportunity to many other silicon and semiconductor companies. That's why you see, uh, for example, uh, Intel, AMD, many smaller companies are jumping into both the data center training as well as the many opportunity for silicon and semiconductor chips for inferences for all the use cases I talked about earlier. Interesting times indeed. So, Sassine, good to see you. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Thank you. Bye. Coming up, bullish sentiment has hit a multi-year high among traders. That's according to a new survey from Charles Schwab. We're going to take a deeper dive into the findings on the other side of the break.
Reddit making an official filing publicly for its IPO. The company planning to list on the New York Stock Exchange, the ticker RDDT. This will be the first big tech IPO of the year. And according to the filing, the company not yet profitable, but losses last year did narrow from the year before. As for sales, Reddit saying it posted $804 million in sales last year. So we don't know exactly still uh, the uh, timing of this. We have some other numbers, though, as well, Josh, in terms of how many people use Reddit. They've got about 73 million daily active unique users in 100,000 active communities here. So, it, you know, it's it's not the biggest social platform out there, but, but it's, 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 it's up popular there. Yeah. and highly visited. Um, remember, Reddit was valued at $10 billion in 2021, I believe. So we'll see what valuation they kind of look for during the share sale. A couple other tidbits, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, they're tapped as lead underwriters. Then the bigger question we, we've sort of been talking a lot about, Julie, you know, obviously 2023 was pretty slow. There was a trickle yes, of IPOs yes. and the expectation was, could we see that trickle turn into more of a stream um, this year? We were just talking to Brianne Lynch from um, Equity Zen, who said in part, she was waiting for a big name to take the public market plunge. And if that name, she said, kind of got a very strong support, you know, bear hug from the public markets, right. that would obviously go a long way to encouraging others. Right, and this is a, uh, a so-called placeholder mm -hmm. statement, right, filing. So we don't know the pricing, we don't know the valuation, to your point, we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. One interesting thing that our producers mm. noticed, mm. trying to tap into the zeitgeist, I mean, I guess Reddit is pretty zeitgeist to hear, but they mentioned that Reddit it quickly responds to new topics based on real experiences. What are some examples mm. of their communities? Our travel, our Vanderpump rules, our Taylor Swift, of course, our sure. machine learning. So, uh, you know, is it really an IPO filing in 2024 without a Taylor Swift name drop? <laughs> and a little AI, you're scripting everything just, on just there. Just put well, all, course, the, all the buzzy words why in not? there. All right, in the meantime, the bulls are back in town. More than half of traders are feeling bullish about the U.S. stock market, according to a new survey from Charles Schwab. That's the highest reading of bullish sentiment since 2021 and a significant uptick from the quarter prior. With more on Schwab's trader sentiment survey, we're joined by James Kutsulius, Charles Schwab, head of trading services. Thanks for being here. So this is a this is a pretty big reading here. What is what is this kind of bullishness driven by? Does it tend to be pretty correlated with what the market is doing? Is that what's going on? Hey, Julie, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, great, great question. So obviously, the sentiment will be driven a lot by the macroeconomics of the environment. But what we also see, we do some behavioral work, too, with what we call the Schwab Trading Activity Index, where we monitor not only the sentiment here in the survey, but the actual actions, the buying and selling that clients are doing. And we see a strong correlation between the two and the most recent recent Schwab Trading Activity Index. And so I think it's a combination of the macroeconomics and the overall economy and, and feeling a little bit better there. And, and you'll also see in the numbers, trader confidence has, has risen a lot as well, uh, up to almost 70%, up 20% from the last quarter. And I think that confidence does get driven by the, the macroeconomic factors, but it's also driven by the fact that we're finding traders being more and more analytical, more and more research-based, leveraging the tools, leveraging platforms, leveraging education and content like your show in order to make those decisions. And all those are hallmarks of the Schwab trading powered by Ameritrade um, value proposition. And so I, I think it's a combination of the macroeconomic and actually what traders are actually doing. And James, so so bottom line, people are feeling, it looks, it sounds like more confident. When they look at, you know, for the year ahead here, James, though, and you ask them, listen, what are the concerns? What do they tell you is on sort of their wall of worry here? Is it inflation, election, geopolitics? Yeah, it's a great question, Josh. I, I would break it into two categories. From a worry perspective, geopolitics and the macroeconomic conditions sit at the top of the list. But then we also ask them, um, you know, what else are they most believing will affect the economy? And that's sort of a combination of probability and materiality. And so we see geopolitics sort of blend into both. But when they're actually thinking is going to have the biggest effect on the economy, they, they swing a little bit away from the macroeconomics and more towards the election and, and interest rates and what they think the Fed's going to do. And so what are they doing with their money as a result of all this? Because I know you guys did some survey work on that front as well. 
Yeah, and actually the, the work on what they're doing with their money is less survey driven, Julia, and it's more actual looking at data. Mm. So it's not attitudinal, but it's actual, actually behavioral. And so what are clients net buyers of and net sellers of? And we do see strong correlations right now with what they're saying in the survey. So they're bullish on IT, they're bullish on healthcare. I just saw the section you just did on NVIDIA, right? It seems like everybody's bullish on NVIDIA these days, but we do see net buying in NVIDIA, we see net buying in Microsoft and Amazon as some of the bigger tech names. And then we see a bearishness in financial, the financial sector. Uh, and we sort of see that reflected in net selling of Bank of America. So, so we see both attitudinal and behavioral convergence here, um, which is interesting. Sometimes you see what, what the sentiment is and what client behaviors are actually diverge a little bit. And, and that tells us something different, but strong correlation right now to what clients are saying in the sentiment survey and what they're actually doing. All right, Schwab clients, bullish on NVIDIA, along with, it seems like everybody else, James. Thank you for joining us so much today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. NVIDIA shares, as we mentioned, are soaring today <laughs> on the back of that strong fourth quarter earnings beat, but it's the entire semi-sector that's rising as well today. So as we look ahead, how should markets be viewing the future of AI? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's very own Dan Howley for more. Yeah, I mean, look, we just saw the semiconductors there, and I think the big thing to keep in mind when you're looking at AI is it's two pieces. It's the semiconductors that are powering it, like literally powering it, mm -hmm. and then the AI that is running it. So it's it's two areas to, to look at. Uh, yes, the semis are going nuts right now, except for Intel. Uh, but uh, the, the flip side of things is, uh, you know, Microsoft, Google, uh, Meta, Amazon, they're all running AI and they're all offering AI to some degree or another. Microsoft, uh, Google, Amazon to enterprise, Meta, open source, Google open sourcing uh, as well. Salesforce, they have uh, AI as well, Einstein, GBT, and then uh, Slack has its own AI now. So it really is a segment that you have to look at in two pieces. And Dan, let me, we were actually talking off camera about this and I just want to get your take. When people think of NVIDIA still, they think chips, they think mm -hmm. hardware, but we were talking about how really, when you look at what Jensen Wong is building there, it really is more of a platform at yeah, this point. Yeah, it's, I mean, l l the way that Apple has managed to lock in Customers. Which is a great comparison, by the way. It's a great comparison. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, way, <laughs> the way Apple has managed to, to lock in customers with its, its uh, software services, its hardware, you want to stay on the software, so you're going to get the hardware. You want to get the hardware, you're going to get the, the software with it. It's the same thing with NVIDIA. You're going to buy their chips, you're going to get on CUDA. If things are uh, running on CUDA, then you're going to go and get their chips again. So it's kind of this virtuous cycle for the company itself, but it's also part of the reason why you're seeing third parties try to develop their own chips because they don't want to be locked in. It's the same thing we saw almost with the cloud at first, right? People were jumping into the cloud and they were saying, oh, I'm all, on, I'm all in on Amazon or oh, I'm all in on Microsoft. The smart people said, I'm not going to stick on one, I'm going to go multi-cloud. And now everybody goes multi-cloud, so you're not stuck with one company. That's what these large uh, cloud service providers, CSPs for those in the know, uh, are doing with their uh, with their chips. They're ensuring that they have, sure, we'll, we'll have our, our NVIDIA chips, but we're also going to have our own, and we're also going to have th some from uh, AMD or Intel to diversify what our customers want, but also what we want. And so if investors are looking at the sort of two sides of AI, if you will, looking at the hardware and software or the, the sort of chip makers and then the companies that are making the product, the AI product, how should they think about that? Is one more attractive than the other? Is it just that there are a lot of choices in terms of how to invest in AI right now? It's, it's almost one is leading the other. You had mm. the software come out first, and now everybody saw what the software was capable of with ChatGPT, and they were like, well, we gotta get in on this. Would be mm -hmm. bozos if we didn't. So now everybody's trying to ramp that up, and so they're going into the chips. Mm. Now you're gonna have to see, and you know, we're, we're trying to see this with, with the likes of Microsoft and Google and Amazon, how much is that investment paying off for them, which will then lead to more chip sales if it does well, right? Because if everybody goes, continues to go all in on AI, it continues to perform well for these companies, well then, I mean, it's a no-brainer. You would want to invest more if you're a smaller company or a mid-sized company because it's proven that it can do well, then it's going to go right back into chips. All right. Wow. Dan Halley, always great to have you on set. I like getting brings pumped the up. energy, brings the insight. Mm, Everything's there. Mainline me some some Duncan, and I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank everything. you, Dan. Thank you. Coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
the closing bell on Wall Street. Let's do a quick check of the markets here. A lot of enthusiasm. Look at that on the floor there today at the NYSE. And why not, uh, given what we are seeing in terms of the activity in today's session? If you take a look at the major averages and where we closed out, big gains, almost 3% on the NASDAQ composite, 2.96% gain to 16,041, just shy of a record, but certainly heading in that direction. The S&P 500 up 2.1% on the day, the Dow up 1.2%, 456 points on the session, as we know, a lot of it having to do with the NVIDIA effect here, um, as we saw it rise a lot, and then tech rise a considerable amount along with it on the day, Josh. A record day on Wall Street, at least for the Dow and the S&P 500. Jared Blickery is here with a look back at today's action. Jared. That's right, Josh. Throw the NASDAQ 100 in there as well. And you can see the NASDAQ composite up 3%. Russell 2000, a little bit of a laggard, but I think investors will take the eight tenths of a percent. Meanwhile, the Dow up over a percent and the S&P 500 about double that. Not surprisingly, tech is the number one gainer today. In fact, the only outperformer, XLK up three and a quarter percent. Then we have consumer discretionary and communication services in the number two and three spots. Those are the mega cap sectors. So mega caps really pumping it today. Then we got financials. Financials is the second or third best sector going back to those October lows from last year. And industrials. Industrials hitting, I believe, another record high today, along with healthcare. So lots of records, lots of milestones being passed here. And let's dive into the NASDAQ 100 because that's where we see a lot of the mega cap action concentrated. NVIDIA, 16% day. Uh, I'll do the market cap calculations as for how much it gained today, but it's going to be north of 350 or 250 billion. And actually, let's do this. Let's check into the market cap right now, uh, shy of uh, $2 trillion. And in fact, because we just got the updated share count this morning, two and a half billion shares, we know that price is going to be $800. So whenever we, excuse me, whenever we hit 800, that's going to be the two trillion milestone for Nvidia. And then let's take a look at the leadership as well. And not a whole lot of red there. Let's take a look at the percentages. There we go. Socks. That is a uh, chip ETF. Not surprisingly, that is up five percent today. New York Fang. That includes uh, a lot of these high flyers. That's up almost five percent. Momentum trade. We got the Nasdaq 100 software, U.S. Internet disruption, and. Uh, I haven't looked at crypto all day. Let's take a brief look at Bitcoin. It was around 52,000 yesterday, around 52,000 today. So not a whole lot of movement there, but still lots of excitement. You can see Ethereum up over 3% over the trailing 24 hours. And now let's get a final tally on the Dow where we got Microsoft and Apple in the green. Salesforce up 3.5%. JP Morgan, I believe that's another record high along with Visa. Each of those up over 1%, guys. Jared, I have an updated number for you yes. on the market cap increase for NVIDIA. Please. Two hundred and seventy seven billion dollars. Didn't you have your uh, full screen there? Yeah, there we chart go. Of two. There's the big red number. Two hundred seventy seven. Seven seven. So record value being added to a stock's market cap in a single day. Thank you. It's a big number. All right. Thanks so much, Jared. Appreciate it. Well, NVIDIA is stronger than expected quarterly results, driving markets to record highs. But investors, of course, also keeping an eye on the Federal Reserve. Remember that? And when the central bank could start cutting rates. Federal Reserve Vice Chair Philip Jefferson warning of the danger of easing too much in response to improvements in inflation. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker says the greater risk is for the Fed to cut rates too soon. Joining us now, Stephanie Lang, Hamrick Berg, Chief Investment Officer. Hey, Stephanie. So we were sort of having this debate. Maybe you can help us out here today. What is more important for the markets right now? Is it NVIDIA or is it the Fed? Well, I think today, you know, clearly NVIDIA is the, the gift that keeps on giving. And I think if you look at what's driving, you know, the broader market, it's the earnings growth that we're seeing not only from NVIDIA, but the broader market. And I think going forward, that's going to be what's going to be driving stock prices going forward. So that AI halo is really taking effect. And I think that's going to drive not only earnings, but stock prices going forward. And Stephanie, as you know, I mean, stocks do follow earnings. What do you expect for profit growth in 2024, Stephanie? Well, we're expecting double digit growth. I mean, that's the consensus right now. We do think it's going to come down. 
um, you know, just because of the margin pressure going on. And I think it's quite optimistic. However, I think it's pretty encouraging because, you know, you've seen the growth of earnings. Today was NVIDIA. The, the MAG7 has tremendous growth. And while 2023 was all about the multiple story, earnings growth is going to be driving stock prices this year. So we're encouraged that we're going to see, you know, going forward much better than we've seen in the past. 2023 was barely positive. And we think that's going to be a big driver of stock prices going forward. Um, and then let's bring the central bank back into it as well, because obviously it's on the back burner today, but it's still going to be something that is important to consider. Um, why hasn't it been more of a stumbling block for stocks that we've pushed back those rate cut expectations? Well, I think it's because we've had such strong economic momentum. The story has been a recession, recession, recession that has never come. And here we are, we're, we're posting good economic numbers. The GDP for the first quarter is going to be close to 3% right now, according to Atlanta Fed Now estimate. And I think if the Fed is going to cut, which is the expectation, they're going to be cutting into a strong economic picture, which allows for um, a soft landing, most likely. And so I think the narrative has changed that um, you know, the soft landing is kind of the consensus trade. And I think you can take that risk out of it right now. And that's been, you know, what's been driving stock prices that the Fed is going to be supportive in a tailwind going forward. So, Stephanie, given that backdrop, how then do you want to be positioned in the equity market, Stephanie? What, what tractor, what, what sectors look attractive to you? Well, you know, I think it's important right now to stay diversified. Um, you know, it is exciting to see the the Magnificent Seven and all their earnings growth, but it's such a big part of the market. I think what is exciting is to look at some of these sectors that haven't really participated in the in the past, and maybe are seeing a turn in earnings, like healthcare. Um, it had a pretty poor earnings picture in 2023. It's going to have the highest earnings growth after tech and um, communication services. It's cheaper than the overall market. And it's had quite a bit of momentum this year. Um, it's, you know, up more than the market. So I would say, you know, lean into those areas that are unloved, but we'll be um, putting up some good earnings growth for 2024. You know, Stephanie, it's interesting. We've been, it's, it's an election year. We've been talking more and more about a presidential election. And one of the things you said in your note is that you can expect some market support from Washington in this re-election year. What could that look like and what effect could that have? It's a great point. If you look back at the last 14 re-election years, so someone is in office and looking to get re-elected, guess what? They're going to do whatever they can to support the economy and the market. And what that has led to is in all 14 of those re-election years, you've had positive stock market results. Of course, we're well on our way this year, but uh, you can expect that if there is some economic weakness coming out later this year, you're going to see Washington step in and really support the overall economy. So we think that's a good tailwind. It's a good data point, And, you know, it helps our expectations for this year. Stephanie Lang, Hamrickberg, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good to see you. We got into it. Second quarter results uh, coming out and hitting the wire. The shares moving down a quick 2% here. And um, Josh, you have them in front of you because I'm having trouble pulling them up. Let right me, yeah, now. we got into it. So EPS 263, it looks like Julie versus 229. Revenue 3.39 billion versus expectations of 3.38 billion. Looking ahead, uh, Q3 EPS 931 to 938, the street was at 970. So that is a miss and maybe explains why, at least initially here, we're seeing a bit, a bit of a, a drop in the after hours. F reiterate their full year guidance, by the way. They're still calling for 1589 to 1611. Street was closer to 16.04. Right. And they're saying third quarter revenue will rise 10 to 11 percent here, but it doesn't seem like that's anything that is helping uh, matters as well. Um, and I guess if you look at their different segments, that's what's helping out here. Consumer group revenue, though, was down by 5 percent. 
uh, because I guess the IRS opened later this year. Um, and Credit Karma revenue, they say, was flat compared to the last year, although the company had been seeing declining revenue in that Credit Karma segment. So the fact that it didn't decline was good news. And finally, small business and self-employed up 18 percent. Protax group revenue was up uh, 8 percent as well. So that's how the different groups stacked up. But overall, seeing that negative reaction. Yeah, and of course, AI-related questions too, Julie. Don't forget because it's 2024. So right. you know, can right? AI do my taxes already? We have. There's going to be for sure. You will have questions about Intuit Assist. Right, financial assistant. You'll have that on the call. Look for that color. By the way, um, uh, who's the street? Twenty-three buys, eight holds, one sell. The average price target is about six forty, and we are just there now mm. in the after hours. All right. It's my turn. It's your turn. Go for Coming it. Coming up, shares of Wingstop higher today on the back of their latest earnings report. The company's CEO, Michael Skipworth, joins us in studio to break down the numbers on the other side. Wingstop posting a big earnings beat on the top and bottom lines earlier this week. The stock trading higher today after a slight dip post earnings with much of the street suggesting it was caused by perhaps a more cautious outlook than expected. Wingstop CEO Michael Skipworth joins us now along with our very own Brooke De Palma. Welcome to you both. Michael, let me start here with this outlook. So domestic same-store sales will grow mid-single digits this year, and that did track with analyst expectations, but maybe some on the street were suggesting it was kind of conservative in their, in their opinion, but walk us through the forecast. What are you seeing? 
Yeah, our business was um, was really strong in 2023. We had a record year, actually the strongest year ever for the brand. And we delivered an 18 plus percent same store sales growth, which was primarily driven by transactions. And that's against an industry backdrop that's actually measuring declines in transactions. And so we have a lot of momentum in our business and we saw that momentum, momentum accelerate. And so for us, we're really confident in our ability to continue to drive same store sales growth. And we commonly will anchor on our three to five year outlook to start the year. But we feel confident in our ability to continue to grow on a record year, which is pretty remarkable when you stack that guide of mid single digit same store sales to what we delivered in 2023. You know, Michael, you definitely set the bar high there for investors. That was certainly the case here. I do want to hit on that increase in frequency among lower income consumers. You seem like you were a one off in the major, you know, the overall industry. What do you think the state of your consumer is? And do you feel like you were sort of immune to that pullback among low income consumers? Wingstop, we often refer to ourselves as being in a category of one. Mm. And consumers, we're not a high frequency occasion. Consumers engage with us on average three times a quarter, once a month. It's an indulgent occasion. And so what we have found is that when consumers are feeling pressure, are wanting to pull back, they often pull back on those high frequency fast food occasions and they save up and almost want to reward themselves for that indulgent Wingstop occasion. And so what we saw in our business in 2023 was the fact that we were bringing in a lot of new guests and we were actually seeing that frequency uptick because we were bringing in new guests through a new occasion for us, chicken sandwich. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they're learning like the rest of our guests to navigate the rest of our menu. And we're seeing an uptick in frequency in that low income bracket, but we're actually seeing an uptick in frequency in every income bracket, which is really exciting for us. That is interesting. I want to talk to you too, Michael, about pricing. So you're gonna raise prices, I guess, by about one to 2%. It sounds like there's a, a bigger price hike though coming to California, why is that? We've taken a historical approach of being very disciplined around pricing, and we do a, a historical cadence of about one to two points of price a year, and that's allowed us to protect that value perception score with our consumers. And in 2023, we actually measured improvements in our value scores with guests, which is really unique in the industry. In California, there's about to become a really high uh, increase to minimum wage, mm. and so our brand partners there, our franchisees are gonna have to take a little bit more price. But our model is a bit unique in that we don't have a really big roster. Our average unit volumes are $1.8 million now, and you can actually run a Wingstop with as few as four team members. So we do have to take a little bit of price to offset the increase in minimum wage in California, but it's not materially above what we're gonna be taking um, as, as far as the whole system of one to two points as the system, but in California, it'll be somewhere around that mid single digit range. And do you plan to add more automation to stores given this uptick in labor inflation? I think for us, our labor profile is so efficient to start with. With as few as four team members, it's hard to take much labor out. What we're actually seeing is as we continue to grow our average unit volumes, which just in the last year have increased on average $200,000, it's almost as though our labor line becomes a little bit fixed and we start to see leverage on that line. We're able to put more sales through the, through the restaurant without adding labor. And let's talk about competition for a second, Michael. You know, large national chains moved into the category. Popeyes, for example, right? I hear they did pretty well with it. When you think about Wingstop, what do you think about in terms of your competitive advantages? I think for us, Josh, we actually love it when other brands promote Wings because if consumers are aware of Wingstop, there's really not a decision tree. They choose Wingstop. And so what we've seen historically is when other brands are out there promoting Wings, it's actually a tailwind for our business. And I think it goes down to the quality and the value that we deliver to our consumers. Our wings are cooked to order every time. They're hand sauced and tossed in our 11 craft made flavors that really are unique. And so consumers, once we call it that first bite experience, but once they try Wingstop, they're hooked. I do want to hit quickly on chicken prices. We have seen them moderate as of late, but of course it was a major headwind in 2023. How is early 2024 shaping up and do you expect it to be another headwind this year? What's exciting for us is we've made a lot of progress in our supply chain strategy, and that strategy is centered around minimizing the volatility that our brand partners see in food cost. And we actually have a pretty good outlook and have structured agreements with our strategic supplier partners to where we, we're, we're gonna solve for a food cost this year that is in our target of mid 30% range. And at that range on that 
averaging a volume of $1.8 million, our franchisees are enjoying a less than two-year payback on their investment in Wingstop, which is fueling unit growth. 2023 was a record year for us, 255 net new restaurants. But even after opening that many restaurants, we have our brand partners signing up for more. 95% of the restaurants that we opened are existing brand partners reinvesting in Wingstop, which I think is one of the strongest statements you can make around the, the health of the unit economics. Mm. Michael, I'll get it you out of here this. When you're at a Wingstop, what's your go-to wing? <laughs> I am an original hot guy. All Aww, flats. Yeah. Plain and simple. Yeah. All flats. Yeah, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And Brooke, thank you as well. Mm. Still to come, cellular and internet service providers AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile are experiencing outages across the United States. Today, we'll speak to an expert about the impact on the other side. Yeah, some earnings from Block coming out after the close. The fintech company raising its outlook for 2024 adjusted EBITDA, now looking for that figure to reach at least $2.63 billion. $2.4 billion was the prior forecast coming to us from uh, Block here. This after a fourth quarter adjusted earnings per share actually missed estimates, although adjusted EBITDA beat estimates in the fourth quarter. Revenue coming in at $5.77 billion, that to beating estimates, as did Cash App revenue specifically. The um, shareholder letter from Jack Dorsey, mm. quite interesting here, Josh so? Lipton. Well, first of all, he says, he starts with saying, we've done a lot recently to reduce our costs. Now we're going to focus on growth. He mm. says they've reached their cap 
their um, workforce cap of 12,000. And so they're working with that number of people. But he talks about that the focus now, the goal for the company is how to grow Cash App. And he talks about doing that in a three-part strategy, banking our base, moving up market by serving families, and building the next generation social bank. Lots of big big ideas big ideas Jack is big on big ideas there you go we well, you know it's interesting too to see this this move in the after hours because it's been kind of uh let's call it muted the expectations mm. for this one i mean heading into this print the stock was already down around 10 percent this year it was it was in the red over the past 12 months as well down seven or eight percent but you did have you know it's interesting if you look at the financial analysts who cover this name most were actually bullish and i think because you know you would hear them talk about listen we think they would say there's some new cost discipline at the company. Um, we did hear about you know um, them cutting jobs, and I believe that was right. last month. So they had been more, more bullish. Um, another thing um, I'm going to be interested to hear about, that cash app unit, we did get those re reports that federal regulators were kind of looking into whether the cash app leaves the door open. They were to, to money laundering, mm. uh, to terrorism financing. So I'd, I'd be interested on the call. Do they give any more color insight about, about those reports and what's happening there? Yeah, some of the new um, products and services they're trying to offer are interesting, too. I'm curious exactly how much that contributed to growth in the quarter. In other words, one of the things they're doing is um, some sellers get free hardware up front in exchange for a higher processing rate. So that's one of the, they're just trying different experimenting, it sounds like, to try to increase um, some of their services, some of their flow. So we'll see if that stuff actually works. All right, at least initially, investors yeah. happy. Yes. Moving on, some good news for AT&T customers. The telecom giant saying last hour restored an outage that started overnight. 75,000 people reporting problems. Customers across the country were unable to make calls, text, or access the internet without Wi-Fi for roughly 12 hours. Company is not saying what caused the outage, but news of the resolution not doing much for the stock. It's edging lower on the day. Joining us now is Hugh Odom, Vertical Consultants founder and president. Hugh, it is good to have you on the show. And maybe you just, uh, I want to just start getting your, your general take on, on this event here, Hugh, because this outage, listen, it was widespread. It was national. As we, as we noted there, a lot of people impacted. What's your response, Hugh? Well, as you mentioned, this has been a crazy morning for AT&T and the other carriers because usually when you have an outage, it's localized or even regionalized. But when you have a widespread outage, that's a big issue because you're seeing something that gets outside of the control of AT&T. When it gets outside of the control of AT&T, you start looking at situations by which somebody outside of AT&T has got into their system. And right now, the wireless networks, the infrastructure, the cell towers, et cetera, are spread too thin with a rollout of 5G. So it exposes this situation even further. And I think this is one of the situations we're going to encounter with this continued rollout of 5G and the underlying infrastructure not meeting up to that demand. So, Hugh, it's Julie here. So what needs to happen then to prevent this from happening? Is it just... Or is it just growing pains and it's going to happen as 5G gets rolled out? Is there anything that can be done to prevent it? Well, I think two things. I think, one, we have to understand that with 5G, you're going to spread the network and you're going to see some exposure. So you need to really look and see how you can at least know where those exposures are and address them if they do come to fruition of having an issue with them. Second, as I mentioned, we have a lack of cell sites out of the United States to, to accommodate 5G. That's just a simple fact of it. We are lagging behind the rest of the world. Unless we build out more cell towers and upgrade the ones that are out there, we're gonna see this continual issue both in urban and more particularly in rural areas where you have that spread of coverage. And the big issue there is AT&T recently said they're going to get away, get, give away or get rid of, sorry, landlines. And most of rural America depends on those landlines for emergency services. And without wireless service, what do you turn to? Would you expect to you the number and severity of outages like this then to actually kind of ramp in the quarters, the years ahead? I think you're going to see more and more issues because you're seeing more and more traffic on the on the road, let's say. Equate this to kind of driving down the road and you get more cars on the road and you don't have wider lanes. And when you got more data coming across those internet services or sorry, wireless services and networks, you're going to see more and more issues pop up. That exposure gets greater, the traffic gets greater, the overload becomes more a problem. And that just turns into bigger issues like we're seeing today, a nationwide uh, outage. This doesn't really happen that often. How, what do you make you of how AT&T sort of handled this whole situation in terms of their reaction, their response, their their messaging? 
I don't think they have had a message. I don't think they've had a response. I think the response is we're sorry for the outage, but we're not going to tell you what the reasoning was behind the outage. I think that's, you know, the Department of Homeland Security is investigating this. AT&T is to apologize, but no one of the tens of thousands, if not more, of people who've been impacted have got an answer of what happened. And that is an issue because we rely upon communications. It's our fourth utility. And when you shut that down, you can't communicate with people. But also, as I mentioned before, you have an emergency response system that becomes paralyzed because of it. Not to make light of it, but it's nice to have a break from the phone once in a while, even if it's involuntary. But you, no, yeah, seriously, though, I know I know it is very important um, in a lot of situations. Should they be, um, will we see customers leave at and I mean, this is just a one-off, but should they be concerned about that? I think at and and Verizon especially are so far behind T-Mobile, that's my personal opinion, that any bad news is worse news for at and I think that they're trying to catch up. And, and with this situation, uh, sometimes they say, uh, you know, you, any news is good news when you're out there. This isn't good news because this uh, says not only do they have an issue with service, it's exposure. And that becomes an issue for security si situations when you're using your wireless devices, your phone, et cetera. So I don't think it's a good day for at and um, And it seems as though shareholders feel the same. Hugh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, we're going around the horn, checking in on some of today's top trending stories, including Apple's latest attempt at sports. Stay tuned. We've got more Yahoo Finance on the other side. Managers want you to be in the office. Workers want to be at home. Leaders need to develop the right set of skills to understand when do I bring my teams into the office. 
it's not equal, right? It's about equitable. We need to figure out how we as a business adjust to our workers who want to be at home rather than saying we need to go back to the old way of working and bringing people back to the office nine to five. Why this seeming conflict? Managers want you to be in the office, workers want to be at home. I don't think it's quite that clear cut, but what are sort of the conflicting motivations here? Well, look, remote work is better for caregivers and women, even women who are breadwinners, do the lion's share of caregiving in America. And therefore, remote work is better for women. Women are 25% more likely to take a job if it's remote and 85% of hybrid workers say that they wanna stay hybrid. So the numbers speak really for the importance of hybrid work, and we know that it's more helpful for women and for people with intersectional identities who feel like when they're in the office, they have to be code switching, they have to look the part, they have to speak in certain you know, coded ways. And so being at home, having that flexibility, being safe in somebody's surroundings is better for the average worker, and that should be more incentive for a leader to say, we need to figure out how we as a business adjust to our workers who want to be at home, rather than saying we need to go back to the old way of working and bringing people back to the office nine to five. I think you're absolutely right, Lindsay. I think we're in, we're sort of betwixt and between, yeah. in the sense that the old model, which is largely predicated on control, right, Julie? I mean, if you think about what culture was pre-2020, we all came to the office between nine to five, it extended to the walls of the organization. And now as we've transitioned, um, there is this palpable sense of a loss of control. I find the productivity argument really interesting though, because for about three years, we told people that we were incredibly productive, you know, working remotely, but that narrative seems to have switched. And I'm not sure leaders have actually built the case compelling in a compelling way. There's good um, evidence of the loss of innovation in mm -hmm. certain, certain industries that didn't come about because of perhaps some of the serendipitous connections. You know, it's there for us to collaborate, to innovate, to build teams, to mentor that person for whom it's his or her first job. And she doesn't have a network. And they're also quite explicit about how this is actually going to work. We're going to be in the office on Wednesday. We're going to innovate together. You're not coming in to do the heads down Excel spreadsheet because you can do that at home. Coming out of this, like, what does work look like? Where does work happen? What's the, what's the new equilibrium, do you think? I think employees don't want to be in the office when there is no understood purpose to being in the office. Yep. And so the kickback against three days a week, one day a week, four days a week has less to do with the number of days. It has more to do with the fact that there's a breakdown in trust and it feels like control for control's sake. And then when you layer in the other questions of equity and inclusion and, and real reasons and costs associated with coming into the office in a high inflation environment, you know, driving people in without that sense of purpose, I think is really where the divide sits. So in our organization, we're very flexible. We allow people to work from home. Um, that being said, um, if there's a need to be in the office, we're having an offsite, we're doing in days for our sales team, we're doing a collaboration session to drive innovation on a product, we expect people to come in. And we've never had anyone say, I feel like I shouldn't have to come into the office to engage with my team in a way that's productive. The office is a new channel for collaboration that needs to be leveraged when appropriate. Yes. And leaders need to develop the right set of skills to understand when do I bring my teams into the office and for what purpose, as opposed to just relying on blank policy. Elon Musk made a comment about this where he said it, it sort of fosters inequality. Like, the, all, you know, the people building Teslas, they don't have a choice. You can't build a Tesla remotely. Uh, do you think that that's a, a valid point to be made? I, I, I really don't think it is because it's, it's, it's not equal, right? It's about equitable. And so we've got a number of clients who've been very intentional about recognizing that it's the work that needs to drive the opportunity for flexibility. So they've actually said there are opportunities for flexibility in all types of work. Now, if you're at the retail store or the distribution plant, we've got schedules, but... The real thing, you know, to the point about choice, it's about control. Do I have control? And so for someone at the, on the shop floor, we're going to introduce short shifts. We're going to introduce shift swapping, shift sharing, um, and putting it in your control so that you, do, you know, if you, you can't come in because you've got a sick child, great. You just swap shifts with someone who can actually operate your piece of equipment. Let me ask you this. Does this balance persist 
when the job market tightens? I think you'll see a little bit of the, the return of the empire, if you will. Um, but I suspect the genie is out of the bottle, Julie. I think employees are really going to be hard pressed to sort of, at en masse, mandate that we go back to, you know, being in the office. Hello and welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Josh Schaefer with Brooke De Palma and Pras Subramanian. And today we're starting off with a new app from Apple, the Apple Sports app. This is an attempt from Apple to probably drive more users to their streaming service. We know Apple's gotten into streaming sports, namely the MLS, right? And they've also got into documentaries that involve sports. There's a Patriots documentary that recently came out. So they're sort of getting more involved in the sports space. You can see the app here on your screen. One of the key features of it really is just live scores. Uh, it has live scores. When you click on upcoming games, you can see the standings. There's some gambling lines that go on there. Uh, honestly, Pross, it, se it seems like a pretty surface level app right now. The app was just launched, but it doesn't quite have some of the features from some of my favorite sports apps. I'm thinking of maybe ESPN where you click and there's news that comes up with the app and other videos that come up with the app and sort of more content that it brings you. I, I favorited my favorite team here, the Boston Bruins, who play mm -hmm. in the NHL. And it just isn't really giving me a lot on the Bruins was sort of my surface level takeaway. Again, the app just launched maybe there'll be more sort of features to come with it. Yeah, I mean, it's like almost an alpha stage right now, right? Because mm. basically you, you can either add leagues, which the NFL is not part of, like you noticed, the NFL is not part of it for some reason, I mm. guess because it's, it's season's over, mm -hmm. or you can add your favorite teams, and then just the scores or upcoming games come up, you can't click in, you can't get any news, there's no video component yet, but I think you're right, maybe it's a way to drive users to maybe the Apple TV app, where you know it has a pretty cool way, I have it, and it has a pretty cool way of notifying you when, when certain games are close or how to watch them and stuff. So yeah. maybe the integration is coming later, but right now I think the Yahoo Sports app is better, right? I think the I think ESPN is, app is better for, for both scores and kind of like maybe some video too. Yes, I mean the old Google to see how your team's doing just isn't the thing anymore. <laughs> All of that. I do that. that right, but, uh, but I truly do think that app, this has been a, a long time coming as Apple really tries try to make their mark in the sports arena. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw them do the halftime show with Usher. Now they've had the halftime show for quite a few years. Yep. It formerly was PepsiCo. It just goes to show that Apple is really doubling down, trying to get in the space. Of course, Tim Cook, super excited about this, <laughs> tweeting that he can't wait to use it during the 2024 MLS season, which kicks off tonight, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, that's it? sure. Between Inner Inner Miami CF and Real Salt Lake um, on uh, Apple TV, so we're really just trying to see returns from this MLS partnership that they did. Don't know if they're quite seeing the returns that they had initially hoped for. Yeah, it seems like at the surface right now the best use case is for the MLS, right? Because that's yeah. where Apple has the content. One of my one of my favorite things about say the ESPN app is that ESPN has so many sports rights. So when you click on a game you're able to watch the game inside mm -hmm. that app. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it sort of creates more content for you inside the app and with push notifications too, as Pross mentioned. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see sort of where it goes for Apple as they get deeper into sports, maybe even get more sports rights, how they're able to leverage the app. I think sports right will be a game changer for this Apple TV. In addition to that, they're also getting, these stats are supplied by DraftKings, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, you know, where does that partnership evolve to? Sure. And how do they work together to ultimately grow this? All about the betting lines, always, Brooke. Always about <laughs> the betting lines. <laughs> and Tim Cook, noted Auburn fan, right? I think alum too, Ooh. so maybe that's... He is, he is a sports guy. So Go, Tigers. Go Tigers. That applies yeah. to like half of the colleges in the country. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So Dipping sticking with Dow components, Josh, Dow components. <laughs> We've been hearing about companies like Walmart and Coca-Cola keeping a watchful eye on weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro, concerned about the impact on food sales. But European food giant Nestle says they may have found an opportunity. CEO Mark Schneider today saying that there could be uh, increased demand for products that address nutrient deficiencies like Nestle's Vital Performance Protein for muscle mass and Garden of Life probiotics for gut health. But Nestle, look, they make everything from chocolate to Purina cat chow, okay? So right. this is like a <laughs> right. massive, massive company. It's make, a water. Like 90 brand, like, yeah. you know, hundreds of brands, you know, water. But the thing is that they can pivot and they can do this kind of in a way that say, hey, you know, if the market's going this way, we're so vast that we can actually have like the ancillary to Nestle chocolate, which is like vital proteins, right? So they can do that. I think that's probably going to be a focus of the company and other big giant CPG companies, uh, food giant companies, staples companies that are going to have to try to compete 
in this world. Yeah, protein is the name of the game for 2024. So many companies looking to get in protein. We heard from Conagra earlier this week that they're trying to introduce more frozen meals with their Marie Callender brand that's more protein dense. And, you know, snacking is getting so big, but consumers are also more mindful given that this has been in the news lately. They want a more protein dense snack. I mean, that's more opportunities for companies like PepsiCo, for Coca-Cola, really trying to play up this impact of GLP-1 that we've seen since now really in the news at the end of 2023 in October. You gotta love just the flip that we saw here, the right? Flip. The complete flip. It's February, so it was, it was about six months ago that GLP-1s were bad for all food companies, right? Yeah. Because people weren't gonna eat anymore. And now I think people are starting to realize that GLP-1s also come with a diet. When mm -hmm. you listen to a lot of these companies talking about people taking them, right? You And it's a tailored diet. And so it feels smart to me for some of these companies to say, okay, now I can, we can get into that tailored diet space and actually sell more products and more diversified products than we used to sell. And basically, these might be net good for us. I, I, I don't know, I just appreciate the spin. It's a long the way spin. we've come in the six months. The spin on portion control, the right. spin on pack sizes. It's a, a new wave, a new opportunity. Right. I mean, speaking personally, I kind of want more protein focus or heavy ah. snacks. Uh, Yahoo people, um, <laughs> the snack machine over there, whatever, would like some, you know what I mean? Like, but I think there's an opportunity there for yeah. the Nestle's quick, world. Quick snacks, right, yeah. like a Nestle Co. makes, sure. Yeah. Like where are the protein forward snacks that, that are like cheap and, and readily available? Because I think when you're at the, at the work site, like you want to eat and you don't want to run out every time. You, you yeah. want the good macros coming from Nestle Press. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll put in a call. We'll see, we'll see if they can get a macro see, count on the Not the, the Purina cat chow. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely do think that zero sugar, plant-based protein, we've seen this really ramp up in recent years, but now companies really doubling down and taking on this opportunity as, in, as innovation really comes into play, as we sort of put behind all the COVID-19 supply chain issues and so on and so forth that we saw a few years ago. Um, but the GLP fear really baked in now. It sort of has settled in. It was such a, a hit to stocks back in October, and now that's sort of settled out for mm -hmm. sure. And there was one other thing, too, on the GLP-1 space that came out today that I found interesting, guys. Goldman Sachs coming out and saying that they think that GLP-1s could actually add 1% to GDP eventually at some point. 1%? 1% to GDP essentially saying that because because of how obesity works in America yeah, and there are so yeah. many obese people yeah. and it makes people unproductive, you're going to the doctors, et cetera, if you were to remove that and make, the, and make those people healthier, it would actually contribute more to the wow. economy. So sort of another thread on the GLP-1 story that will be interesting to follow and sort of see how that develops. There are so many tentacles in this story, oh, so yes. many different retail to oh, airlines yes. to everything. But guys, I was at a consumer conference and mm. the evolving consumer dynamic was definitely on the menu at this event in Boca Raton, Florida. Got back late last night from the conference hosted by Consumer Analyst Group of New York, where some big names in food like PepsiCo, Hershey and Mondelez all presented. And after Ozempic fears have settled in, consumers pulled back amid higher prices and a few lingering post-COVID supply chain issues have settled out. Food executives were so eager to move the narrative forward in an effort to get back volume. Now, Hershey's and Mondelez, they did nod to this price pack architecture. So I thought that was a really interesting way of framing it, ultimately providing more sizes, more value opportunities as people really get back on the go and are really mindful of how much they're eating and how much they're spending here. The, the price pack thing is interesting to me, right? Because to me, I feel like when I go to the grocery store, you think your pack of Diet Pepsi or your bag of chips or whatever is just supposed to cost a certain amount mm -hmm. without really noticing how many cans you're getting or how many chips you're... Like, it's yeah. a smart way to frame it, right? You think your Diet Pepsi should be $5 or whatever it is, and even if they're giving you 10 cans instead of 12, you'd be like, oh, yeah, it's 5 bucks. Like, it's always 5 bucks. Yeah. And then you kind of maybe don't fully take in that you're not getting the same amount of product and you feel better about it or you're just more willing to spend a certain amount on that product. So it seems like a smart move in terms of at least how I think about shopping at the grocery store and buying food. Yeah, and also too, you have to keep in mind, there's so many people who are buying in bulk, they have bigger families, mm -hmm. and so they are super mindful about the price increases that we saw last year. That's causing a pullback in volume. And so when they go to the store and they realize just how much, much more they're spending, these companies ultimately want to get out in front of it and offer something that's a little bit leaning towards value, but ultimately still getting bang for their buck, even though they are higher in cost. You know, so we've been seeing that food prices have been sort of a little bit stickier than other types of, mm -hmm. of, of items, right? Yeah. Did they kind of talk about 
why that is potentially? So volume recovery was a hinted at topic around mm -hmm. the curve of the conference. Basically, they're trying to get ahead of it by saying that we're talking about this price pack architecture. We're talking about innovation was a big play and also talking about M&A. That was another little tease mm -hmm. there. But really, it was not sort of it, well, it was sort of the elephant in the room that these companies need to find a way to bring back consumers. They need to find a way to lure people back in after they took such a hit last year with higher prices, higher commodity costs, and so on and so forth. So innovation really is something all these companies are looking at in 2024. We heard some crazy ones. Hershey's introducing a partnership with Shaq. I was going to say, Brooke, Shaquille we buried the lead here. We haven't talked out. about Shaq yet. You oh, were in the he's same done room everything Shaq. now. Yeah, so if you want to sell more Hershey's, <laughs> you just partner with Shaq. Shaq's awesome. He has so the Midas touch. I mean, yeah. anything he, he does. He really, really does. Yeah. Yeah, he walked out on stage, as always, looks so tall. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he was sitting next to Michelle Book. They were both chatting about how they're doubling down on gummy segment. Mm -hmm. Jack said they're going to win big in the gummy segment. They said it's the fastest-growing sweets category. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder to myself how this has to do with consumer preference sort of changing. So I didn't think that gummies was the fastest-growing sweet segment. I'm going to go ahead and assume that gummies are what made Shaq grow taller and bigger. So I, <laughs> so I'm going to go, go find some gummies. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to some gummy <laughs> ones or something, guys. Hot take from Josh. Cheaper. But coming up next, starting on Monday, Yahoo Finance's Travel Theme Week kicks off. Here's a look at what to expect when we take a trip into the travel sector. It's been a few years since COVID upended the global travel sector. The world is now largely vaccinated. The recession we were all hoping to avoid didn't happen, and the consumer is still spending. Oh, and the Fed is about to cut rates. So, looks like we're poised for another huge year. Well, maybe. But there are more than a few headwinds to contend with, not to mention trends that could reshape the way that you think about your next vacation. Is Delta the airline best positioned to hold market share? Are cruise lines about to hike prices on a stream of never-ending demand? Is Astro Tourism really the next big hit for 2024? And should you really drive your Tesla from LA to San Francisco? Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights puts you at the center of the story, looking at planes, trains, automobiles, and any other form of transport you can think of.
Let's take a look at what's trending after hours. We've got booking holdings topping Wall Street estimates on the top and bottom lines in the fourth quarter. Gross travel bookings also coming in above expectations. But CEO Glenn Fogel saying the company is confident in the long-term growth of leisure travel, uh, initiating a dividend as well, $8.75 a share. But the shares are down by 5%. He also made some comment about the continued conflict in Israel and the effect that that is having on the company's business. And that appears to be what is pressuring the shares in the after hours. Let's also take a look at shares of Live Nation. Those shares down 1%, even after the company posted record revenue in the fourth quarter. Live Nation calling 2023 its biggest year ever. Concert attendance and ticket sales hit all-time highs. Spending per fan rose double digits across all major venue types. Still, it's not all smooth sailing ahead in the new year. The company is still facing scrutiny from lawmakers and ticket holders after its Taylor Swift ticket buying snag and an ongoing Justice Department investigation into business practices. Uh, the shares little changed year to date. Meantime, shares of Carvana, those shares are up 20 percent as losses are narrowing. Carvana missed revenue estimates for the fourth quarter, but delivered better than expected adjusted EBITDA. This comes amid the company's focus on efficiency and profitability. And looking ahead to the first quarter, Carvana says it expects adjusted EBITDA significantly above $100 million. And time now for to watch Friday, February 23rd. Tomorrow we'll be watching earnings from Warner Brothers Discovery. Earnings season rolls on here, Julie. We're pointing tomorrow. We expect that before the market open. Remember NVIDIA, we were talking about expectations were kind of sky high? Yes. Not here, no. Stock's down about 15% already this year. It's down about 40% over the past 12 months. Uh, what we're looking for tomorrow, loss per share estimate is six cents, revenue of 10.5 billion. And we're going to be looking at the subscriber numbers also mm -hmm. for streaming services there. Um, subscribers looking at, at least what people are targeting, 95.6 million, which is, it, it's actually backslid a little bit, but we'll, but it would be growth quarter over quarter, I believe, even though it's not the highest that it's been. So, you know, we'll see what, how that shakes out and probably see some reaction based on the Maybe that uh, sports streaming venture with uh, Fox and we'll ESPN, maybe a little details, that. price, maybe. name, structure, who yeah, knows? Maybe. Yeah. All right. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.